So genetics are a huge part, right? Healthy plants are a huge part, right? Lights are a pretty important part. <laughs> Did you increase your yield? Switch into Dazor? Yeah, that'll happen. Oh yeah, you got it back though. Yeah, not cured properly. Sat in a basement somewhere for a while. Seen some pretty healthy plants from you. It's a good problem to have though. It's good. Let me see if anyone else is going to jump in real quick. I'm about to start the presentation. If you want to watch it all, you're welcome to come. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. Great yeah. Nice meeting you, brother. All right, Great thanks, day, Aaron. Yeah, Your name's Aaron? Yep. It's a good name. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Hey, right. ah, nice, nice to meet you, Aaron. Nice to meet you. Yeah, yeah, where are you at? Right here. <clears throat> all right. You guys ready? Good, good, good. Sweet. Good to go. Welcome, Ray. Yeah. If you want to jump like in the middle or something too, might be a good viewing spot. <clears throat> Can you see the, the camera there? Am I in the shot? Cool. I'll just slide out of it. <laughs> okay. Hey, everyone. I'm Aaron, nice to meet you. I work with Dazor Lights. I've been growing for 13, going on 14 years now. Uh, large scale production out in Washington State in Oregon, and then came out to Missouri to do uh, large scale CBD and outdoor organic farming. Uh, so I've done a bunch of different types of farming, synthetic and organic and synganic, mixing the two. Um, playing with my own genetics and breeding and then also you know working through tester packs and seeing where kind of yield can be diminished and where yield can be increased um, by working with really good genetics and then also keeping the plant really healthy and so a lot of you guys here are growers or are experienced in it so if you have any questions or you want me to elaborate or chit chat about stuff feel free to to jump in through this presentation <clears throat> Thanks for coming, by the way. All right. So the 10 cardinal parameters of botany, the things that we kind of gear all of our growing around is the, the light, the humidity, the temperature, CO2, carbon dioxide, airflow, and water. Now oh, my mic might not have been on, check, check. Um, so light, humidity, temperature, CO2, airflow, water, and that's water in the air and water in the soil, soil temperature and microbes, nutrients and oxygen. <clears throat> so not necessarily in this direct order, um, but typically what we concentrate on the most, what's going to make the biggest difference is starting from the top down. So working with our light, then working with our air and our environment. And then working with you know the temperature and CO2 in that environment, and then genetics plays a role into this the whole time. So um, <clears throat> genetics can be a diminishing factor. So even if you grow the best stuff ever and it's only you know genetically capable of growing a 15% total cannabinoid, it's only going to grow a 15% total cannabinoid. So depending on what you're looking for out of the plant, if you're looking for higher terpenes, higher cannabinoids, starting with genetics and then building that total environmental health is the most important to maximizing your yield. 
Water is really important. <clears throat> sometimes we don't water our tomatoes and sometimes they still grow. Uh, you can have really good heirloom genetics and that will allow it to you know, work in a, a harsh environment. <clears throat> or if you have genetics that are really finicky, you want to make sure that you're, you're tuning those things in. So, and I will get into the nutrients and the 17 essential elements for growing and kind of how they make a, a difference on balancing those things. Microbes are really important. So the cardinal parameters of botany used to be the nine cardinal parameters of botany. If you go onto our website under LED Talk, LED Talk, you can read the whole 10 cardinal parameters of botany. <clears throat> and it's pretty long, so I like to use Control F and just search for what I'm looking for in that document that I wrote. Um, so it, it explains, you know, daily light integral, PPFD, um, explains organic nutrients and synthetic nutrients and blending organics so that you can kind of do the math to figure out what your NPK is going to be at the end. Are you an organic grower? I use liquid organics. So like nectar or rooted? West Coast? Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so I think West Coast might have like it's mostly organic, but then they have like a couple of products that have some sort of, you know, um, chelated element. So like the calcium might be chelated. Essentially, what that does is it takes that cal calcium and it makes it into a more bioavailable product so that it can come up a lot quicker and bind with things. I'm just going to shut this door. So there's, there's nutrients and then oxygen as well. <clears throat> so oxygenation in the soil is really important. Having some sort of perlite or rock that allows for that oxygen to flow. When you water your soil in and you completely soak the top and you allow that water to drop down, you'll notice that bubbles will come up from that and that's actually pulling fresh oxygen into the root zone. <clears throat> Do you guys have any questions on first slide here? Okay. What was the 10th one that was added? Uh, microbes. So I added in microbes because a lot of that research is kind of taken off in the, the late 90s and then early 2000s. If you go and read articles, it'll start in 94, 96, 2002, there was a boost, 2006, uh, 2012, a lot of different scientific articles on microbiology and understanding what the little guys do in our soil and how they break down nutrients and chelate those nutrients and make them bioavailable for the plant. So essentially, there's kind of two forms of thought in feeding the root zone. You either feed an organic soil as a battery and you're feeding the soil and not the plant, or you use something synthetic where you're supercharging the roots and allowing it to uptake really quickly. Um, with salt, as we call it, synthetics, uh, they're salt based, so it's not NaCl like table salt, but it's a similar structure to a, a salt um, in chemistry. So that salt base is typically pretty harsh on microbiology. Uh, you can think of it as literally putting salt on a slug and how that dries it up and messes up the osmotic pressure in the cell and that'll happen with synthetics. So when you're running synthetics or synganics, it's good to keep your soil charged with microbes. Uh, in organics, you can start out, give them a really heavy boost at the beginning and let those microbes kind of proliferate over time. But when you're running synthetics, you want to, you know, every week or two, bring in a fresh batch and keep that balanced out. <clears throat> Which can be expensive, but salts are cheaper, so. What was that? Thank you. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so targeting spectrum. This is general plant spectrum here. And you can see that right here we have the chlorophyll A and the chlorophyll B at the 410 to 425 and 460, so these peaks. And then we have chlorophyll B and chlorophyll A again. So this dark green line right here is your chlorophyll A and the light green is your chlorophyll B. <coughs> now a lot of photosynthesis happens in the red zone between 600 and 700 nanometers. On this scale, it only runs to 700. Anything 7 to 800 is in your, your far red spectrum. And what will happen is your photosystem 2 is activated in your 600, and then your photosystem 1 is activated over here. 
Now, including far red will actually add an elect extra electron in photosynthesis, and it'll boost that photosystem too with extra energy. So by having a specific amount of far red, you can increase that, that photosynthesis. Hey guys, welcome. And by increasing photosynthesis um, little bits over time, by the time you're done growing you know, for eight weeks in a flowering cycle, you'll return a lot more of your investment back. Welcome. We just jumped in. Um, we're essentially covering increasing yield, maximizing your, your return on your investment when growing. Um, we could talk about tomatoes, but mainly this is geared around cannabis. This is a cannabis show here. So this is the Parmac spectrum. <clears throat> In our light, uh, we use a white diode that's a horticultural diode. And you can see the range from 642 to 692, specifically this point right here to this point right here. And what that does is it steps up the energy, starting at the 640 and then 650, 660, and that's called the Emerson enhancement effect. So when you begin this early, you get a lot more energy over time and little bits of it that steps up. It's called quantum excitation. It's exciting the molecule early and stepping up the energy level. So a lot of LED diodes, you'll see just a harsh, see if I can get it right here, a harsh peak at the 660 range. Uh, they have high power diodes that allow for it to peak just at the 660. With this diode, it, it costs a little bit more, but it's kind of like the Ferrari of diodes so that you get a balanced horticultural spectrum. <clears throat> and something that you can use in your vegetative and something you can use on clones or completely through flower. So you can use one light all the way through your cycle. And what we do is we reduce the blue and reduce the green. So when you're picking out diodes, you could say, okay, we wanna use this type of diode that's a horticultural diode. But then there's specific color binning and different chromaticity bins. Um, and then there's essentially like four different bins within a diode. So you pick the top diode and then pick the top bin that you're looking for that exact color. And then pick the next top bin that you're looking for it to be exactly in that range. So um, by choosing you know, the best, uh, we ensure that you know, we give our growers the best. And what we want is for people to come back and say, oh my gosh, you know, I love this light. It's causing me to have to buy a bigger tent. Thank you for that. Um, we just want success for growers and continually. 85% uh, of the parts that go into our light come within a 40 mile radius of us here in St. Louis. So we want to build something that's gonna last for a really long time and something that is going to continue to return on the investment. <laughs> I'm just gonna to touch on this right here. This is a Kranz anatomy of photosynthesis. There's C3 and C4. C4 is, whew, that's bright. C4 is corn. Uh, C3 is 95% of plants. So in a C4 plant, 5% of the other plants, um, you get a, a double photosynthesis uh, with the way that the photoreceptor is set up. So mainly we're targeting C3 plants. Plants like corn are better off um, for the yield and for the cost to be grown outdoors and, and turned into you know, oil or ethanol products, things like that. So. So mainly we target plants that are gonna bring investment back when you're growing something indoors and paying for the electricity. This is the Emerson enhancement effect. Do you guys see that, that spike in the red? So that's how it steps up the quantum excitation. It starts at that 642 and it steps up an initial step and then secondary step. And then there's called the Emerson uh, drop off, which is in between your 660 range and your 730 range, there's a bit of an energy drop off. But when you bring in far red, you get to excite that energy back up and speed up that photosynthesis. So, any questions so far here? No? Cool. 
means I'm, I'm doing my part all right then. <laughs> Um, so yeah, higher yield, you know, in increased density, that's our goal for our customers. And then along with a reduction in the amount of green. So if you have too much green, it'll pen <coughs> penetrate the mesophyll layer. So over here, this is the mesophyll layer. You can think of it as like the outside of our skin. And when we get a sunburn from too much UV light, and it penetrates too deep and it burns the under layer. So green as a wavelength will penetrate the plants too much and then the plant can't use that energy as photosynthesis and then ends up burning it. So some lights will be driven too hard or just have a, a spectrum that's too intense. Um, so with our lights consistently over and over and over again, uh, we've had growers come back and say that we haven't burned their plants. Um, we've had growers that wanted to test it. I had three specific growers, uh, two here and one in Oregon that said, I'm gonna grow it up to the light, test this out, actually four now. There's a guy in California that just did it too. So growing all the way up to the light. Now I don't recommend that because the crossover in the light, our bars are four and a half inches apart. So that crossover happens about five inches away. So you get really even light at about five inches away from the bars. And that's also what we're gonna talk about is um, increasing your yield through canopy management. People go, okay, I want a lot of yield, so I wanna grow a huge tree. And that works well if you're outside, but when you're indoors, you wanna have a, a really even canopy and for all the light to hit that canopy evenly. Do you guys know what DLI is? Daily light integral? So this is kind of a, a new school of thought on how much plants need light. Um, for as long as I've grown, you know, it's been, okay, vegetative 18.6 or 24 hours, flower 12.12. But when you start to get into a greenhouse and you look at how much light is the plant getting and over what period of time, is there, is there a cloud that comes through for two hours in the day? This is where we start to take photons and add them up and then say in the whole daytime, it got this much as an integral. <clears throat> So the calculation is up here. You guys can also use our QR code and view this on our link tree. This will all be posted. Um, this specific slide in here is also within the lead talk online. So if you guys want to read how to calculate DLI, um, the equations are in there. So here we've got clone and you can see it starts at about 10 DLI and then it moves up through vegetative. And what's happening here is we're running the lights at 18 hours, right? So it's not that we're running more light to the plant, because in vegetative you might be at five, 700 ppfd, which is photosynthetic photon flux density. That's how many photons are hitting a specific surface at that specific time. This is how many photons are accumulated over time. So in vegetative, you know, it comes up here and we run it for a longer amount of time, 18 hours. So the total amount of photons is more. And then when we switch it to 12-12 and increase the light, you're actually getting less DLI. So this is something to, to kind of think about in plants and how they're photosynthesizing over time and how we're using supplemental light in greenhouses um, to kind of balance, okay, we've got two hours of clouds coming in, so we want to turn those lights on for those two hours and balance out that DLI so that it stays consistent all the way through the day. Uh, the calculation is up there. There's 3,600 seconds in a day. Say we're running at 90, 922 ppfd. Uh, pretty common for like a, a bigger light to be running that much ppfd to the canopy. Um, so times 12 hours per day gives us the 39.8. Um, yeah, there's the, the calculation, so that's all in the article as well. I'm not going to go too deep into DLI, but these are our main controllable factors when we're growing indoors. We've got our light, our humidity, our temperature, our CO2, and our airflow. All of these play a role into each other. If we have less light, we might have more or less humidity, depending on how the plant is breathing. And this is the stomata right here. So on the leaf, a stomata will actually open and close depending on the vapor pressure deficit. So it's depending on how much humidity and how much temperature you have. And if you're in that Goldilocks zone, which is the next slide, 
it'll open and close either faster or slower, releasing more transpiration from the plant. It can cause your leaves to curl if it's releasing too quickly. So when I was growing in the, the acre greenhouse in Washington with 3,000 plants, sometimes that temperature in the morning would go from 65 degrees up to 115 degrees. And so we had to make sure that we were balancing that VPD in the greenhouse the best we could. And now that's kind of tricky sometimes. So. So what we were doing is watering heavy in the morning, our humidity increases, the plant has enough water to keep that, that vapor pressure consistent, and then going through in the middle of the day and hitting it with a quick water so that that humidity level stays the same. And as the temperature increases, we increase that humidity with it and keep the plants nice and happy. So a big part of increasing your yield and the reason that we say we talk to our plants is because we go in and we look at the plants and make decisions on how to keep them consistent and even. If I came in and you know gave you 10 hamburgers one day and the next day I give you two french fries, the next day I give you two french fries, the next day I give you 10 hamburgers, you're not going to know what's going on, right? So having one hamburger and some french fries one day, maybe having half a hamburger and some french fries the next day, it keeps a balance. So always trying to be consistent on what we're doing and how we're delivering <clears throat> to the plant. So there, in outdoor growing, there's a, a lot of factors to deal with. Have you guys done outdoor growing? Yeah. What was your biggest factor that was hard to deal with? Oh, um, it's just a completely different approach. Exactly. It's a, a completely different approach. Bugs. Bugs? So pressures, uh, vectors as we call them, certain bugs will bring in other issues. Um, you could have an aphid that hits your plant and chews up the sap and then releases the sap and then the ants like the sap so the ants will come in behind it and then you have ants carrying aphids and aphids carrying ants or you have a, a thrip or something that goes and crawls on a plant outdoors it's got some powdery mildew on it and then it flies in and it comes and climbs on your plant and it munches on the leaf and then releases that spore right next to it because it's a vector it's carrying that potential problem. So with outdoor plants, I think the biggest thing that we can do is to keep them as healthy as possible. Um, sometimes when you have a weaker plant, the, the bugs or the powdery mildew will go for that plant, or you can use that to attract the, the bugs or the pressure towards that and then remove it completely. So in the greenhouse, uh, years ago, I started using lemongrass plants which lemongrass takes the extra nutrients really well. They grow really big, and then they also keep spider mites away. So using lemongrass, I made a barrier in front of the plants. So when we walked in the greenhouse, you had a line of lemongrass on both sides, and that kept any of those pressures from entering into the grow. If somebody walked in with some spider mites and walked back out, the spider mites would not want to go towards that pressure. So. There's also an outdoor growing, you know, acting quickly, um, spotting things, scoping things, making sure that you're able to uh, properly identify something. If we think that a thrip is a spider mite and a spider mite's a thrip, we might treat a little bit differently. Or if we think an ant's an aphid and an aphid's an ant, um, you know, one of them's a, a cinnamon treatment. It's pretty easy, low cost. Another one's something like Botanigard WP22, which is a, you know, it's a fungus that attacks the aphid, um, which is really expensive. So, any other thoughts on outdoor? Um, yeah, I mean, give it to me. <laughs> yeah, sure. It's just uh, the biggest challenge and the biggest success has always come really, at least for me, and the rows that I've worked on are always soil health. Soil health, so, right. And that's something where, you know, when you're talking about things at the 20 or 40 acre scale, uh -huh. it's a different approach because now you're working with the seasons, the timing, you're working with soil biology in a very different way than what you can do in a greenhouse. Right. But it's really, you're still working the same white cycle, you're still working with the kind of like seasonal enzymatic change of the plant so that we can <clears throat> provide the basis for the right nutrition. Um, that means something different. Um, when you're also focused on biology in the soil. 
than what it means in a greenhouse in a more controlled environment. Uh -huh. But either way, it's always the, those are the two critical factors. I mean, the sun's the energy, but you know, but the soil. Earth is positive to grow. Right, right. Uh, I think you might have stepped in right after I mentioned like so, uh, using organics to charge the soil battery, right, yeah. and and balancing that. Um, that's just where our success. Is there's, I mean, you and I could probably talk for a couple hours on soil biology specifically. Um, balancing, you know, bacterias or yeah. balancing fungus towards the season. So at the beginning of the season, the soil is bacterial dominated. By the end of the season, you get the leaves that fall. Um, you get more of a fungally dominated yep. situation. I think a good way to balance that is things like cover crops, where you're able to add that nitrogen, you know, late winter, you're able to lay those cover crops down, pull in those nitrates from something like clove, where you're you're building up that battery without having to go feed it. So, you know, I had a, a 10 acre CBD farm that I was consulting for out in Joplin. Um, you know, there was another one in Defiance, and I would go around, there's 10 different farms that I worked for before I started working for Dazor. Um, I would test all the soil, right? And then take those soil reports and build the nutrients to specifically balance out that soil. <clears throat> and I think that's a, a huge portion of outdoor growing, right? Is actually knowing what we're growing in, what's the cation exchange, um, essentially your, your positives and your negatives uh, in your anions and your cations that allow for the uptake in that soil. Um, so when you, you have the ability to spend two, three, five years working that soil and getting it balanced, it's wonderful. But when you go in to a brand new farm and they go, make it grow the best, you, you have so much time to do you know, what you're trying to do. So f for your example, you have soil that's yours essentially, right? That you're able to work with and, and till and play with and build up. You can have a compost box, but when somebody asks you, hey, come out and I want you to grow the biggest plants and I want you to build the soil. Well, that's where it comes into brewing large scale organics and bringing that biology in through a tea form and then pumping that out consistently throughout the grow and balancing out what is there. So that's at least what I've found. Yeah, I mean, I've helped a bunch of other farms too. And where I've seen them make mistakes with cannabis is treating outdoor cannabis like indoor because they're used to growing indoor. But you get to the and what do you mean by that? Um, you manage. Um, like, like I think your vapor pressure deficit is a good example of how that functions in an indoor space versus how that functions outside. Okay, gotcha. And that changes your watering regime completely. And you've got to be a little bit more sensitive to the environment. It's, right. You don't have so you have to be more responsive to it instead of being able to control the parameters. And when somebody comes out of a greenhouse and they're used to controlling that and then goes into a field, the connection's not always there. It's, it's a learning curve. Yeah, I uh, spent a, a lot of time checking the weather, you know, checking the weather the next day, checking the weather the next week. Um, and then in certain places when you grow, you get crazy weather patterns where you don't know what's happening. You gotta be able to, to make that decision. Okay, is it gonna pour today with a downpour or is it barely gonna miss us? And if I don't water that a lot in the morning and that storm doesn't hit us and it's all sun, and those plants are wilted midday, and I can't water because it's too hot outside, right? So there's that, that fine balance of scoping things out and going, okay, let's make what is gonna be a medium guest level and give them you know, just enough water that they could get through that heavy sun, and if we need to water again at night, we will, you know, and that kind of thing. That's at least what I found. Um, and just watching the plants, mainly. Just watching, learning, starting to be able to read your nutrition levels and being able to look at it and go, okay, it needs a little bit more nitrogen and a little bit more potassium because I'm noticing a tiny bit of yellowing on the edge of the leaf and this little brown spot on there, right? So the yellowing is the nitrates at the top of the canopy off that edge of the leaf and that little brown spot's the potassium. So you start to be able to correlate which nutrients are affecting it which way to bring up that total overall plant health. And then adding things like silica to an outdoor grow, um, strengthening the leaf and the rigidity of it so that when a tiny bug 
comes by, say a thrip, comes by and wants to chew on that cannabis leaf, and all of a sudden it's too hard for it to get its mouth on, it's going to go somewhere else. Um, so bringing up that total health and making it hard for the, the bug to want to enjoy that. Now when we put too much nitrogen in plants outdoors, it makes that leaf soft and it makes bugs want that juicy leaf. So um, not running too many nitrates, but having a, a fine balance that you're able to allow that plant to take off on the days that it is photosynthesizing a lot more. Um, so I mean, mainly this, this talk is you know based around increasing yield indoors uh, and balancing th these things indoors. And so I think the, the biggest thing is just making sure that you have good genetics, you have good light, good airflow, and then you know, you're balancing the, the microbiology as well. So let's talk about canopy management. How do you guys like to grow? You like to grow trees like that, right there? Just picture perfect. Uh, this picture comes from somebody you guys all might know, Bitcoin Mint One. Uh, Andy, he is one of my favorite growers around here. Super humble guy, and he does a great job. And I asked him if I could use this photo um, to explain canopy management, because far too often I get people telling me I want to grow a tree, and I want to grow it up through the light, and they've got nugs up here, and they've got nugs down here, and these little ones are not going to receive the same energy that the tops are going to. <laughs> so spending our time on training the plant and making sure that the tops are consistent and even, or the, as close to that as possible as we can get, gives us a ton of stuff. It gives us uh, even light to the canopy, it balances out the hormones, balances out the carbohydrate exchange in the plant, keeps microclimates consistent through there. So you might have a different temperature and humidity here than you do down here, and that's your, your microclimate there, where you might get you know powdery mildew that forms in an area that's not getting a lot of airflow and it's getting too much humidity. Um, so balancing all those things out, lollipopping from the bottom and then trimming down from the tops. I specifically like to, on indoor grows, um, top, 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 lollipop, top, lollipop, top. But right before I flower, depending on how I'm doing it, lollipop up the bottoms and just leave a little bit at the top. So that I've created that even canopy and then created that even microclimate underneath to allow it to just take off and flower. Um, we all have different growing styles and that's the beauty of growing, right? We all play with different experiments, play with different genetics, play with different lights and somebody could have a better light than somebody else but the other person could do better because they balance the, the hormones or balance the nutrition or they have genetics that are superior to what they're looking for, right? So um, that's what I think is, is the best part about growing and allows us to all come together. Um, you know, you have a lot of split in this world uh, from time to time where you get you know, Democrat or Republican or red or blue, but in cannabis you get an atheist and a Christian talking about their ideals of cannabis or you know, somebody from the city and somebody from the country and we start to lose that, that competitive uh, thing that turns into a, a we're in this together and I think that's a beautiful thing about cannabis. Um, more tops generally equal more weight. So when you have, you know, say every top produces an eighth and you get 50 of those tops right in an even canopy and you spent an extra two or three weeks training it to do that, you're going to get more yield out of that plant. Some say bigger roots, bigger fruits, but if you look at rock wool growers uh, that are pumping salts into it that don't have a huge root zone that you know push a huge plant with a pineapple sized cola, um, that's a different style of growing. Um, now they might not have the same probiotics and microbiology on that plant, so it might not be the same health that we're consuming, or especially if we take that plant material and make it into an edible form where we're actually consuming that biology on that plant. So. Water, the Goldilocks zone. Have you guys ever overwatered? Yeah. You're not a grower if you haven't overwatered. <laughs> uh, have you guys ever underwatered? Yeah. For sure, right? And so that's the, the balance is what is my temperature? What is my photosynthesis? And how much water do I need to supply in order to, to balance those things out? So um, 
I mean, you could be a grower and, and water perfectly every single time. I, I have blue mott tips uh, out there at the table if you want to check them out. Um, they're a little ceramic tip that releases as it dries out, it'll release water. Um, great way for new growers, and it seems like most of you guys are pretty experienced. As an experienced grower, I love it as a fail safe. I'll set it really lightly just in case something happens. If I go out of town, you know late night, early morning, something that doesn't match up with my scale but keeps things consistent. So, And then there's dry bags. So too wet, too dry, too wet, too dry. Um, sometimes we want to give it a little bit of water. Sometimes we want to give it a lot of water and let it oxygenate the soil. Uh, sometimes we want to dry that back until the plant is kind of wilting a little bit. And then that way it's thirsty and hungry and then we can pump it full of food again and it's ready to, to take that up. The thing about drybacks is balancing microbes, and specifically outdoors. Um, when you get a situation like this, you don't get a lot of microbiology happening in there. You have certain species that are dominant that can survive, that are extremophiles, but then you also aren't, aren't really balancing things the way that you would want to in an indoor grow. So um, drying things too far back can kind of kill off the microbes and then too wet can smother them as well. So just kind of being in that Goldilocks zone of not too dry and not too wet. And here we have the, the fun part. Uh, have you guys heard of the Haber-Bosch process of pulling nitrates from the air? Um, so that was in 18, let's see, Fritz Haber lived from 1868 to 1934. Carl Bosch lived from 1874 to 1940s. So around World War II, they, and this comes on the work of two or three other scientists that were trying to figure out how to pull nitrogen from the air. Our air is 70% nitrogen, and plants use a ton of nitrogen. And what this process does is it takes air and it compresses, compresses that air until you pull that nitrogen out as a salt. And so that's where salt nitrates come from. And these are, are readily available to the plant. It's, you know, since World War II, it's boosted um, the total amount of humans and how many people we can feed on the earth uh, a ton. So there's a lot more humans and we're feeding a lot more humans. In order to do that, uh, you, you have to have a form of nitrogen that's going to grow big enough plants to yield enough to feed those humans. And then there's the Justice von Liebig um, barrel. I, I'm sure some of you guys have seen this. Have you guys read the Grow Bible? The Cannabis Grow Bible? So, long time ago, uh, when I was in college, I was playing beer pong with some buddies, and I kind of disappeared, and I went in the grow room, and I was reading the Grow Bible, and I was sitting there, and and I was just flipping through it, right? And it was the first time I'd like really jumped into it heavy. And my buddy comes down and he goes, hey, where have you been? And I was like, sitting in this room, you know, it's, it's Hawaii in here, it's 85 degrees, wind's blowing, it feels good. Um, I've been reading this book. And he goes, you've been gone for three and a half hours. And that was the moment that it truly hit me, like how much I loved learning about plants and learning about that environment and what they needed. Um, so this barrel, you know, Justice von Liebig did this in the late 1800s, middle to late 1800s. It's essentially showing a diminishing return. If we don't have enough nitrogen or if we don't have enough water, then in that barrel, you're giving it a weak spot <clears throat> to lose out on your potential. So when we start to balance everything out and bring everything up together, then you can increase everything together. Your photosynthesis, um, how your plant's eating. So do you guys know what NPK is? Nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Seems like I'm, I'm talking to a pretty advanced group here, so that's, that's nice. Uh, your nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium is generally what you're going to see on a nutrient uh, regimen or on a box that says, okay, this is high in nitrates, a uh, little bit of phosphorus, and a ton of potassium, and this is made for tomatoes, right? Then you get your other nutrients. So there's 17 essential nutrients. Your bases that are non-fertilizer are your hydrogen, carbon, and oxygen, which helps in photosynthesis. 
And obviously photosynthesis helps us breathe, so making these balances and allowing the plant to photosynthesize faster is also providing more oxygen to the total environment. But then you get into your secondary nutrients, your magnesium, your sulfur, and your calcium. Some people consider these as important as the NPK, as the macros. And then you get in your micronutrients. Um, so generally, I can tell you what most of these do, but you know things like uh, molybni molyb molybdenum. <laughs> um, you know, it's I've read up about it, but it doesn't really stick for me. Um, generally, I know by looking at a plant when it's lacking um, macros or excuse me, micros. But also, when I grow, I'm generally trying to make sure that all those things are there. Right, that there isn't a diminishing amount of boron that causes a plant to look this way. So nitrogen for cannabis is heavily used in vegetative. Potassium is heavily used in vegetative. Phosphorus is heavily used in flowering. And potassium is heavily used in flowering. And then also our calcium to magnesium ratio. So there's a lot of discussion on there should be a 3 to 1 or a 5 to 1. Uh, for me, it's been genetic specific to when plants want to use more calcium or more magnesium. Calcium you can think of as the, if you were to build a plant out of Legos, it is the Lego. It's the building block of the cell that allows it to give it its structure and rigidity and hold on, along with silica as well. And I don't believe silica is in here, and it should be in there. Um, magnesium, you'll notice that the tops of the leaves have little ridges in them, but also sometimes genetically dependent that'll happen. A, a genetic will produce a plant that has ridges pop to it. So uh, I think it's smart to work with specific genetics and play with the nutrients and make sure that it's not something that is just a phenotype that's showing that expression. So sulfur is also very important and bugs don't like it. So it's a good thing to have a little bit of that around. pH. What's a good pH for? Six. True. <laughs> so uh, you have pH for hydrogen, or excuse me, pH for organic soils, or pH for aeroponics, water growing, where it's spraying. Um, so in here, generally when we're working with organics, you know, we're we're between this range five six to about six five ish. Now when we grow in water, or water only, or like a rock wool, generally we bring this level down closer to a 5.2. So I think the, the sweet spot, like you said, is right about six right there. But you'll notice that the potassium here and the phosphorus right here start to change and drop off at different levels. So when you're growing with organics and you want that phosphorus to come through when you flip the flower, 6.3 is a lot better to be at that range. Microbes will actually help to balance and buffer pH as well. So if you have one that swings one way or the other way, the microbes will actually take that and, and balance it out a bit. Any questions on this one? Comments, concerns? Yeah. Sorry. Speak up so we can hear you too. Whenever I'm flowering, should I, because I usually go for six, mm -hmm. and it's not just with cannabis, I kind of found that everything I grow in my backyard likes around six. Right. If, when I'm flowering, should I bump it up to like, you know, like you said, 6.3, will that help more uh, phosphorus and stuff? Generally, I like to, personally. So you're putting in this can also cause a pH fluctuation. And then pH also fluctuates with temperature. If you get hotter temperature, your pH will rise. If you get colder temperature, your pH will fall. So when you're growing outdoors, and like the other night, I mean, my tomatoes did not like the temperature that it was, you know, it was 36 degrees. So that 36 degrees versus a 90 degree day is gonna fluctuate that. So I think being right in that safe spot is really smart because that will naturally fluctuate. And you can always do a runoff test where you put 6.0 all the way through, collect that water at the bottom and then test that water to see if okay it's actually eight if it's actually eight and I want to bring it down then I need to put in you know a five to balance and buffer out that pH so 
it's it's a good way to test it. And it's kind of a just a safety thing, you know. To be concentrated on that and to be watching that means that you're at that next level of growing. That you're not just throwing my tap water here will come out at a nine sometimes, right? If I'm just watering consistently like that without paying attention to it, it's gonna just bring that way up and it's gonna lock out my my micros, right? And it's gonna change my macros. And so that my nitrogen is gonna be coming in hot, but my you know, my molybdenum molyb molybdenum <laughs> I love that word. Huh? <laughs> yeah, uh, so the old molybdenum here, it, you know, it, it drops off, right? And then it picks up again. So you, your calcium, it's a different range. I think just being right in your general safety zone is a good way to approach it. If you want to take it to that next advanced level and you have four plants that are all the exact same genetics, try making a batch of, of water and then feeding it to three of them and then bringing up that pH and using that fourth as a tester and see if it actually affects it, you know? Good idea. I've never grown in your shifty area. Huh? I've never grown in your shifty area. What do you grow? 6.8, exactly. 6.8? Okay. Why is that? Uh, it just seemed to be a good spot and my, uh, my, water, my well water comes out of like... Six, eight, six, seven. <laughs> right, and, and you're potentially putting phosphoric acid in there or something that if you, you know, put that into small concentration of water, it's going to potentially affect the... Yeah, and up to, I'd say up to seven, too. Yeah, and soil will buffer that. Um, do you add any microbes, like great white or recharge or anything like that? Uh, sometimes recharge and uh, just maintenance and teas. Right, so recharge specifically, you know, it has trichoderma, which is a voracious microbe. Uh, it's going to go in there and it's going to do work. It's a tank. Um, recharge also has molasses in it. And so you're actually feeding the microbiology in there. Yeah. And that'll, we're feeding sugars to the microbes so the microbes can break down the nutrients and feed the plant, right? So that's where it comes into feeding the soil instead of feeding the plant. Uh, in which case, it, it is going to buffer that. But 6-8 isn't really a dangerous zone. It's not 10 and it's not 2, right? So that, that slight buffer is going to be fine. Uh, well water is fantastic. You're getting a lot of the micros in there. I know that you know when I was out in uh, Gerald growing, a uh, lady, or it might have been Troy, uh, the, where they showed me their, their coffee maker that heats up the water. And this thing had a cake of calcium on the bottom of it like that. Yeah, so I mean, testing that water and knowing what you're, like you're, you're using bag soil inside, right? So that's different than testing your water and testing your outside soil and going, oh wow, my calcium's really high. Maybe I should just add magnesium to it to balance that out. So know what you're growing in and know how you're growing and then play with it, you know, have fun. When to harvest? When do you guys like to harvest? Ooh, okay. <laughs> uh, I was talking to, to Gerald earlier out there. Um, you know, he, he likes a lot more amber. I personally like to pull right when I see amber because I don't like a heavy sedative and also the THC in it is going to decarboxylate, it's going to break down, oxygenize and turn to CBN anyway. So if I cure it for a really long time, I can get more of that amber out of it or add more oxygen, add more sunlight, lock it up, add more oxygen, add more sunlight, lock it up and have that convert naturally. Um, Yeah, just don't don't microwave it if you're trying to try it early. It's never a good move. <laughs> so uh, the the trichomes, as you guys probably know, they start out clear, then they turn to cloudy, then they turn to amber. I like milky cloudy. Uh, touch of amber. The second I see it, I know that that banana is starting to ripen, just like a banana goes from green to yellow to brown spots. Same with cannabis. Um, 
Some people really like sedative or they like to use that as a medicine for falling asleep instead of something else. And if they do want more of that couch lock, yeah, bring it to 30, 40, 50%, add another week growth time. When you're talking about commercial growing, every second, every day matters. Uh, when those growers are looking to harvest in 63 days versus something that takes 75 days, they want to turn that around. They want to pull that stuff out, get it curing, bring new stuff in, and get it right on track and going. So in that case, you know, most of the time they're, they're pulling right when they see that amber start to form and they know it's done. And they're also keeping track on a chart saying, okay, this strain took 63 days this time. Here we push at 65 days, we're fine with the 63. And by doing that and adding two more days over time, every single time, you know, they're, they're able to get faster turnarounds. And right, and very, very genetic dependent. If you're growing sativas, they take a lot longer. You know, they're potentially 12 week uh, versus indicas um, that were initially eight week strains and now you know most of the stuff that we deal with is polyhybrids where we've crossed the indica to sativa to sativa to indica to indica to sativa to another cross that's done the same thing and so you get these polyhybrids of genetics that aren't really true land races where something could take 12 or 15 weeks in thailand do you have a question there ray okay i thought you were raising your hand um, do you guys all know how to harvest? Can I just skip this? <laughs> so <clears throat> essentially steps to harvesting, cut at the base of the soil after you've identified. Uh, a lot of people will go after the pistols too once the pistols have turned from like white to an amber. I generally just like to go after the trichome because there are certain strains where the pistols will stay a certain color. So you cut the plant down, you hang it to dry in 50% relative humidity at 68 degrees roughly. When branches begin to snap instead of bend, you trim the excess leaf and carefully cut nugs off the branches. Some people like to do this differently. Some people like to leave the fan leaves on there while it's curing. I personally like to slowly trim down so I'm reducing my amount of work. So I'll cut the plant, I'll take off the big leaves and I'll hang it. And then once it's snapping, I'll come through and I'll do another cut. Then I'll bring it down to tiny little nugs and put those in a brown paper bag. And then I do a two, two bag method. So I take a, a grocery bag, it's a brown paper bag, and I take another one and I fill it up and I put the other bag over the top of it. And then when I need to rotate those nugs, I just grab the bag and I flip it like that. I come back the next day and I flip it like that. And those bags allow for air exchange to get in there and to flow. So once you've already gotten to that snapping point, it's not so wet that it's gonna mold up in that bag. And then you just rotate it until you get it to the right point where you wanna trim it down and add the final touches to it. I think number six is really important. Um, so trim the nugs to their final form and then jar cure. So at 65% relative humidity, you can use a hygrometer. It's a little device that you stick in your jar and it'll tell you the humidity inside that jar. And it's 68 degrees. We don't want to go too cold and we don't want to go too hot. So 65, 68 is a good important number to remember. 65% relative humidity, 68 degrees. You burp the jar two to three times a day, typically when you're first starting out, until you get that relative humidity consistent to that spot. Lock the jars at 60 to 65, and then cure for six weeks-ish. Some people, you know, they like to cure a lot longer. Some people like to cure a lot shorter. I think once you locked it in place and you allow those terpenes to kind of soak into that, that bud material and, and increase that flavor and that smell, and then also break down the chlorophyll, so you're not getting a grassy taste to it. Don't cure too quick, don't cure too long, unless you want it to be really sedative and then you can give an extra cure time. Number 10, voila, now enjoy the fruits of your labor, which I think is the best part of growing. Thanks. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> Uh, if you guys want. You're a lot smarter than I thought. Oh, thanks, bud. Yeah.
Uh, if you guys want any of this information, it's on my business card on the QR code. Um, on here, you can go to our Instagram. It's in our description on our Instagram is our link tree. And then any of this information, you know, I'll, I'll make a video and post it to YouTube as well. So thanks for coming. Uh, any questions about stuff? I have a bunch of them, but I was... Yeah, we, we can talk at the booth. Yeah. Maximizing yields should be two more. More space, less loss. More space and less laws. Maximize your yield, man. It's true. Uh, yeah, more plants will definitely bring up your, your yield. Uh, but what if you only have four plants, right? And you want to make, or like Illinois is only five, right? And then out here in Missouri is six for a medical cart. Um, yeah, and then you know you might have a plant that's that's 12 feet tall, but it's not it's not as dense because of the genetics, right? So. I think just being consistent is, is greatly important. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. I'm Tyler. I'm Aaron. Nice to meet you too. Yeah, come by the booth. We can chat. Okay. <laughs>